So I think we'll move on to our next speaker now. Um, thank you, Christy, again. So now we have Lindsay LeBlanc from the University of Alberta, and she'll be talking about storage and manipulation of photonic signals using the Adler Town Slitting Memory Protocol. Great, thank you. All right, um, I hope you can hear me now. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me. I'm a little disappointed I didn't get to come to the UK to give this talk, but uh, here we are. So, um, and again, I also apologize, I didn't get to see a whole lot of the talks just due to time zones. Um, and so if I've missed <laughs> some reference uh, to an earlier talk, I, I apologize about that. But I'm glad to be here and to give the last talk. Um, actually, here we go. I just wanted to give a little overview. Um, many of you probably don't know exactly where I am in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So one of the more Northern cities uh, here in Canada. It's a city of about a million people and we have a, a nice university where I'm teaching. And um, there's one photograph of our, our latest adventures going on lots of walks uh, given the current circumstances. So uh, in my lab, we have a number of different uh, projects ongoing. And just to start off the talk, let me talk a little bit about that. So I sort of think of my lab as answering two different questions. One is about many body physics and sort of more traditional cold atom physics, which is my background. Uh, but in the last several years, we've ventured into more of the realm of quantum technologies and thinking about how to use quantum systems to our advantage. And so that's um, more where I'm going to focus my talk today, talking about our work in quantum memory. So the different projects we've got ongoing in the lab are uh, related to BEC and quantum simulations, um, to atomic quantum memory, which is what we'll talk about today. But we're also setting up a new experiment to look at hybrid quantum systems, so combining cold atoms um, with cryogenically cooled devices in a dilution refrigerator with my collaborator, John Davis. And then finally, we've also got some work in warm atoms uh, looking at microwave atom optics there. So I might touch on that at the end of my talk if I have enough time. But let me talk about uh, the kind of quantum memory that we do in my lab. So um, I'm sure this is not the first quantum memory talk. I know it's not from this uh, conference. And um, I just wanted to start it off with this little cartoon that I used to explain quantum memory to um, sort of more general audiences. Uh, I sort of think of it as having um, an input signal. Lindsay, sorry um, to interrupt you. I don't think we can see your uh, slides changing. Okay. Sharing is pause. Bring your share window to the front. Um, oh, there we can. It's still, yeah, if tech wants to help me, it says sharing is pause. Yeah. Bring your shared window to the front. I don't know. I think we're seeing your screen. Um, you it's just not in presentation mode, but we can see your slides. Okay. It should be. Okay, I'll try this one more time. That's good. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, okay. So, um, so yeah, we're talking about um, quantum memory as um, having some input signal that we, we care about, um, being able to hold on to it for some time, and then being able to retrieve it uh, either on demand or um, after some fixed amount of time. So, Quantum memory is by no means a, a new um, technology. It's been around in this form for some 20 years now. And I have some long list of references of many of the different um, systems that people are using, ranging from warm and cold atoms to the ion dope solids we heard about in the first talk of this session and other things like color centers, of which there have been many talks this uh, conference as well. So you can think of um, classifying quantum memory in terms of you know, the system that you're doing in it, but also in terms of the mechanism behind the quantum memory itself. So one way to sort of categorize these is maybe between something called an adiabatic memory versus a, a fast memory. And adiabatic memories often rely on something like uh, electromagnetically induced transparency, where there is a dark state versus um, something what you might call a fast memory, which is uh, like the atomic frequency comb that we heard about earlier. So um, the adiabatic memories um, have often been used in the atomic kinds of systems that we work with, whereas fast memories tend to show up more often um, in some warm atom systems, but also in the solid state implementations. And um, what we sort of stumbled across in my lab was combining the two of these ideas uh, into a new protocol that we call the Altler-Towns protocol for quantum memory, 
where we work in the sort of Otler Towns uh, regime of atom light coupling to realize this quantum memory protocol. And just a little backstory is that, um, you know, it started because I have a postdoc who um, had done his PhD in, in atomic frequency combs and came to my lab wanting to learn about atoms and sort of took both of those uh, ideas and really was able to put them together to understand um, quantum memory in, the, in this way. So in terms of an outline, um, I want to tell you a little bit about this protocol, which we call the ATS or Otler Town Splitting Protocol, uh, go on towards some of the experimental demonstrations, and if I have enough time left, talk about some of the other stuff we're doing with things like microwaves. Okay, well, sorry about, um, yeah, <laughs> having not seen anything so far. So just introduction, <laughs> we'll move on here. Um, so in terms of the background, we want to um, think about this problem of how do we transfer some information that's encoded in a photonic qubit and store it in an atomic degree of freedom. And I'm an atomic physicist, so I was thinking, you know, in terms of atoms. And we want to consider basically a simple three-level system in a, what we call a lambda configuration, where we have two ground states that um, are connected by a, a forbidden transition. Um, whether or not it's forbidden or not depends on the tools you have, but in terms of an optical transition, we, we have no direct connection between these two, which makes it a good level for storage. And so if we wanna be able to contain, um, contain the superposition between this ground and this auxiliary state S, and the way we connect them is through two optical fields, which we'll call uh, one is the signal field, which is where we're encoding the information, and the second is our control field, and in this implementation, um, the signal is sort of the quantum field, whereas we can consider the control field to be a classical uh, field that has something like a Rabi frequency. And so the Altler Towns limit that we work in is one where we have a very strong um, coupling between uh, the excited state and this auxiliary state. And that um, strong coupling actually creates a splitting when we consider the absorption of the signal on the other transition. And that splitting is just equal to the Rabi frequency of the transition. So the stronger the laser we use, the, the more split these levels are. And so this is really just a continuation of going from EIT where you have a very narrow splitting to ATS where those peaks are very well separated. And so we can do this in the lab, looking at the absorption on the GDE transition, seeing you know when there's no coupling, a single peak, to when we really turn up the coupling with our laser power, we can we can split that peak fairly straightforwardly. And so what that means is that we're in a regime where the um, the coupling, the Rabi frequency between these two transitions on the E to S transition, is much stronger or is stronger than the spontaneous emission lifetime, so, or the line width of that transition. So that's the regime we're working in, and that's how we define what we call this Otler town splitting. So we can measure it and see that it tracks as it should with power. And then to consider memory, what we want to think about is the different coherences. So we can define two different um, objects, which we call coherence operators, which tell us how much superposition exists either between the G and S levels or the G to E levels. And so these G to E levels is where we have our signal and then the G to S, which I'm showing here, is the spin coherence and that's where we're actually going to store the information. So we have a way of quantifying how much superposition exists or how much information is being stored there. Um, and then the other coherence is the polarization. And so that is um, a coherence that gets excited when you send in the signal, you create the electric dipole moment in the atom and that couples to this polarization degree of freedom. So the, me the mechanism of um, transfer here is that we actually have a dynamics between these two coherences. We sort of oscillate um, the populations between E and S when we have a Rabi flopping going on between those two levels. But if you consider the coherences, you go from having, say, a coherence from G to E, Rabi flops to a coherence to G to S, and then back and forth and back and forth. And so not just the population is, is Rabi flopping, but actually these coherences Rabi flop. And this is um, applicable because that Rabi frequency is stronger than the spontaneous emission lifetime of that excited state. And so you can write down the set of Maxwell block equations. Um, you can solve these in a computer and we do, but we can also make some simplifications where we set uh, you know, these, these limits of these different frequencies to get a very nice closed form of uh, a simple set of equations. And especially if you look at these lower two, and I apologize, I can't get my pointer to work here, um, but the lower uh, two are just a coupled set of equations between the two coherences. And if we think of a cartoon model here, you get uh, an oscillation between the polarization degree of freedom, or polarization coherence and the spin coherence. So the orange and the blue here represent the two coherences and they're oscillating out of phase with one another. And um, 
that is sort of the basis of our, our memory system. The second thing to note is that the polarization is always in phase with the electric field excitation, and that electric field is the um, signal field that we're considering. And so the field itself excites the polarization, polarization oscillates into spin and then back to polarization. And then when we establish, we establish a polarization coherence that couples back to the signal field and we get the signal out that we want. So to turn this into a memory, we can solve these equations more precisely. Um, what we see is that if we send in a signal, we let it oscillate to spin coherence and back to the polarization coherence. Polarization coherence couples to the electric field and then um, we get our signal back out. So this is a lot like the atomic frequency comb in many ways, is we have a sort of fixed time um, recovery of our signal um, due to this sort of periodic rephasing of the dipole that happens because of the Rabi flopping between the two different degrees of freedom. However, we can make it an on-demand memory by just turning off the coupling. So this is the nice thing about the atomic system is that you can turn off um, that Ottler town splitting. You can change the, the sort of, if you want to think of it an atomic frequency comb, you can turn off the uh, teeth and, and bring them back together. And when you do that, you trap the excitation in the spin coherence. And when it's trapped there, you have storage for as long as your, your system can uh, remain coherent. And then you can restart those dynamics again at some later time when you return on your, your coupling field. And so you can do that in sort of this on off uh, mechanism that you see here. Or um, importantly, it sort of doesn't matter what the, um, the shape of your, co your coupling field is, as long as it's on for enough time that the polarization flops down to a spin coherence or back, you have sort of a pulse area condition. So you can have your shape of your control field be whatever you want, um, as long as it's on for enough time to sort of uh, complete one of these cycles. And so we can think a lot about pulse shaping and the other tools that have been around you know, in NMR for many, many years now. And so if we do this, um, we can use pulses that say are Gaussian, and it turns out that you can sort of more cleanly transfer coherence from polarization to spin and back again um, by shaping the pulses nicely. So these are all just um, uh, calculations that we've done. Um, one question one might ask is, you know, is this actually different than what's been done before? And the answer I think is both yes and no. Um, ATS memory is just uh, an analytical continuation of an EIT memory, which has been done like I said, for some 20 years now, um, it's just, you know, you ramp, you turn up your laser beam that's doing the coupling and that splitting that was an EIT window that which was very narrow becomes very broad in the ATS case. And there's no sharp transition between one or the other. Um, and, you know, this uh, question of where, what is EIT and what is ATS has been around in the literature, uh, you know, rattling around for the last 10 years, both in experiment and theory. And so we actually took some time to look at this after our first results. Um, and what this um, plot is showing is just that, um, you know, there is a smooth continuation between the two. In the end, the sort of lowest um, results here show the signal in in the dark red and the signal out in the light red. And they look very much the same whether you're in um, an EIT regime or the, in this ATS regime. Um, the difference is in the time scale, which you can see is quite different on the bottom. But in the middle panel here, we actually show that you can use an EIT mechanism um, in what we call the ATS regime. It's just whether or not um, the, the way the, the memory works is via slow light or via this polarization exchange. Um, but it turns out that it's much more demanding technically to use the EIT protocol than this ATS protocol that we've come up with. So I'll refer you to the paper for many more details. Um, it's a nice complete work there with a lot of explanation. Um, and so this is also from that paper and just the different, the main difference between the EIT and the ATS mechanism that we've got is in the, is in the top graph here, if you look at the polarization coherence. And so, you know, one of the features of EIT is that you don't excite any um, excited state population. And so there's no polarization coherence. And so there's no sort of orange um, excitation in this, in these plots, but for the broadband ATS memory, we do have this polarization excitation showing that the, the mechanism of the memory is actually quite different in these two different um, extrema of how much coupling strength you've got them. So the message here is just that understanding the mechanism can lead you to um, use the memory in a different way. And I think understanding, you know, which one you're using uh, can be quite important. So um, again, in that paper, we can show that if you have a, a large bandwidth and say not so much optical depth, you're in the sort of left-hand side of these plots. Turns out that the ATS memory is better, but if you have a lot of optical depth and you have very long pulses, then EIT performance will win out in that case. 
and I'll skip over that one. So just to get to the experiments in the last few minutes here, um, we've done a number of proof of principle experiments in, in atomic um, systems, in particular in rubidium 87. Here's a, a shot of the experiment. This was actually built to do the quantum simulation experiments, but we've um, sort of taken a lot of time to do a lot of this quantum memory work here too. Um, in our first experiments, we used a rubidium 87 MOT um, with a fairly low optical depth of just about three, and um, we were able to uh, use just about three milliwatts of control power to do the Ottler to pound splitting. So uh, we were able to demonstrate um, the memory in different regimes, sort of the first plot here being the um, uh, sort of fixed time memory, we just leave the control beam on this blue line here and see the pulse come on and then and re-emerge um, some 100 nanoseconds later, or we can interrupt the control beam, turn it back on again and see the pulse come out at some later time, um, both for sort of an on-off pulse or the, the Gaussian signals um, that we use. I'll skip over that for now. We were able to show that these uh, pulses are coherent with one another by sending in a reference pulse at the output and showing that we can get basically constructive or destructive interference with a visibility of something like 90%. Um, and that points us to um, believing that this would be a nice memory in the quantum regime as well. We can use pulse shaping to stretch or compress our pulses based on the fact that this works using this pulse area operation. So we can um, take our control pulses and tailor them to um, see very long or very short pulses. These demonstrations were only about a factor of two, but we have um, actually have some results that are much greater than that, that hopefully will get written up soon. Um, and then we can also use this kind of system to do things like um, beam splitting in the in the time domain. And so sending in um, into the beam splitter, the signal from the light and the signal from uh, that's stored in the atoms as the two ports of a beam splitter, the operation of the memory. So sending in a control pulse acts as the beam splitter. And then we can get, um, you know, excitations either in uh, the spin wave stored in the atoms or through the output signal. And so a simple memory operation can be thought as sort of two beam splitters. Oh, sorry about this reference here. Um, or we can sort of split it into two or four uh, different outputs depending on how much of the pulse area we apply at any time. So um, that allows us to um, sort of do quantum optics types experiments and oh, I'm sorry about this uh, <laughs> reference blocking, but uh, we can show that if we send in two different pulses, depending on the relative phase, we can get constructive or destructive interference at the output. So a little bit like, um, you know, these very classic quantum optics experiments. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about here is that we've also been able to show uh, that this memory works at the single photon level using uh, attenuated laser pulses. To do that, one change that we made was to change the angle between the, um, the control and signal pulse, which uh, lets us filter out any of the control signal from the, uh, the readout, but at the expense of um, making the spin wave grading much more, um, have a smaller spatial periodicity, which does reduce the storage lifetimes to some degree, but um, we were able to see still fairly good storage lifetimes here. Um, and so our signal fo single photon level storage is very low noise, it turns out, and that's because it is a resonant process and we don't suffer from anything like four wave mixing in this case. So that um, is a very nice feature of this kind of a memory. In these demonstrations, we got a signal to noise ratio of about 40. And we're also able to show these sort of um, quantum optics like demonstrations like this beam splitter operation at the single photon level. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is our most recent work um, where we did this using um, atoms that had been pulled to a Bose-Einstein condensate. And here we were really trying to push the storage time. So the early storage times were in the hundreds of nanoseconds. And here we're able to see, um, you know, up to tens of microsecond storage times using uh, atoms that had been both condensed. So that temperatures sort of under 100 nanocalvin. These temperatures are still, this is the uh, uh, last thing I have to do to confirm before we can submit this paper is just um, getting those numbers right. But we're definitely in the sort of uh, nanocalvin regime for temperature here. And so we see an increase in the storage lifetime because um, thermal diffusion is no longer um, as um, dominant. And so that's one of the mechanisms that we've been able to show is limiting the storage lifetime in this case. 
And we also see an increase in efficiency. So these plots show that as the temperature gets lower, the efficiency is increasing, uh, even though the number of atoms and is decreasing as we cool and evaporate those atoms away. At the very lowest temperatures, the efficiency is actually decreasing again. And that's just a technical detail that the atoms the cloud is getting too small and we're only absorbing part of the, the light. And so we need to work on our optics to get very small beams to interact with these very small clouds of atoms. So uh, that about uh, finishes my time here, but I'll just flash a couple more slides. Um, give me the chance here. So uh, we have been looking at atoms and microwaves a lot in the lab and thinking about how to use um, these sort of memory uh, like operations to do things like transduction between optical and microwave signals. So rubidium has these nice transitions, both optical at 780, but also microwave and the hyperfine levels at 6.8 gigahertz. And so we've been working with a microwave cavity, uh, sort of the size of a soup can, uh, made out of copper, and inside of which we've got a vapor cell. And um, we've done a lot of work just characterizing our understanding of um, microwave and optical interactions that are simultaneous one another. And just last week we had a paper published um, looking at what we think of as an atomic radio, so actually modulating the microwave signal and then seeing its effect on the optical transmission um, when you set up the coherence in the microwave domain. And so one nice thing about that is we were able to make sort of a, a, a radio where we send in an, um, a signal that is a modulation on a microwave signal and read it out as a modulation on an optical signal. And these are sort of some traces of sort of before and after um, of sending these signals through the atoms using different modulation techniques. So I'll stop with that and summarize by saying um, we've had a lot of fun playing around with uh, this new Otler Towns protocol for quantum memory, which um, is very low in many of the technical demands, including laser power and optical depth, um, and is also very broadband. So, you know, we think there's a lot of promise for, for something quite practical here. We've done a lot of proof of concept demonstrations um, and are currently working on getting colder for longer storage times, but also thinking about how to integrate real quantum signals uh, to show that this will work in that regime. And then also thinking about how to extend this work from the optical domain to microwaves and um, making some practical devices there. So here's the group from last summer. A lot of this work has been done by my postdoc, Erhan Saglamirak, who's led a lot of these efforts. Um, in, um, with PhD student in India, Rostogi, and then a lot of the microwave work um, was done by Andrei Tretiakov, um, along with a number of undergrads and other graduate students. So the last thing I'll say is that we do have some postdoc positions if you want to join us here in Canada uh, for both the memory and um, the hybrid systems project that I did not talk about today. So um, I'm happy to take questions and wrap up this conference with the last talk. Thank you very much, Lindsay. That was a great way of uh and then be quick, uh, an amazing talk. Uh, we have some questions uh, that are coming up. So the first one is from Dylan Akas. Um, he says, thank you for the talk. And how long was the experiment to show storage at the single photon level? And is the AT protocol outperform previous approaches? So how long, I'm not sure what, how long is storage time um, at the single photon level. Um, so, I guess the most recent results are these in the in the coldest atoms. So I, everything from a few microseconds at atoms that are um, still thermal, but uh, cool to say six microkelvin. So these are colder than the original uh, atoms that we had down to the 15 microseconds at in the BC. So these are the single photon um, level results um, there. And then, you know, the overall performance. So no, this is not a, um, I think by no metric if we beat anybody um, in um, in the performance of this memory at this point. So uh, a lot of atomic memories have seen life sort of times of almost sort of approaching a second. And so we think we could probably be similar if we could sort of beat down a lot of the technical problems, including magnetic field um, inhomogeneities in the system. So uh, like I said, this was not an apparatus designed for quantum memory. And so we um, do have some magnetic field problems that we need to deal with if we wanted to make it better. So we're actually building up a new apparatus to do that now. Um, and, uh, you know, there are similar bandwidth um, protocols um, using other techniques, but we, um, we feel that this is, yeah, there's just, we don't have to work as hard to get to some of these, these uh, benchmarks. So um, I think I'll just leave it at that for now. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Nancy. And that was very okay. interesting.